Thank you, Michael. Thank you, worship team. Always, always, always faithful at bringing us before the throne of Christ, leading us into worship. I love the worship philosophy here at the Cross Church. We, uh, if you want to know what the worship philosophy here at the Cross Church is, read the book of Psalms. Read the Song of Moses, which is repeated in the book of Genesis and again in the book of Revelation. Look at all of the examples of songs throughout the New Testament that are recorded, Colossians, Revelation, Ephesians, and look at every reference that the Bible has ever given to singing and songs, and that's the model that we follow here. What we experience, I believe, at the Cross Church will be repeated again in heaven, not with the same type of instruments, I suppose, but the philosophy behind it because it is divine in its nature. It, it, it is it is ripped right off of the pages of Scripture, and um, we treasure that because we want to mimic on earth, here on earth as it is in heaven. That, that is our, our goal. That was completely for free. I didn't say that in any of the services, but you know, this is our fifth and final weekend service here uh, at the Cross Church uh, for Easter-related uh, events, and so I would imagine you guys will take a nap today at some point. You're probably tired. I'm, I'm, I'm getting more energetic with each service. Let's do three or four more. Let's, let's just have it all the way to the... I'm ready to go. And by the way, if I hadn't said so yet, happy Resurrection Sunday to you, Cross Church. Yeah. I wanted to get that off my chest because almost a dozen times a day throughout these services, I have almost said Merry Christmas. I, and it's just, it's, it's like stuck in my brain, and it's like I'm telling them, don't say it, don't do it, get, get the words out right, because I know what's going to happen in one of the services, I'm going to stand up and say, Merry uh, Res uh, Easter, everyone, and I, I did well, so good job, Dan, good job. Well, when we were thinking about Easter this coming year, I didn't know exactly what text that we would end up on, or, or what exactly, what angle we would be looking at Easter from, but I knew what I wanted the theme to be. I wanted it to be on peace. For obvious reasons, there is no peace in the world, and everywhere we look today, and really for the last couple of years now, there has been turmoil and unrest all around us. And, you know, we've lived in a period of time since 1945, historians have called this period of time the, the, uh, the long peace. And in the 1990s, they relabeled it to the new peace, assuming that the long peace was going to remain that way for an extended period of time because governments now work together and because the likelihood of a geopolitical World War III was unlikely because of the nukes. And, and because of the, the economic entanglement of all of the nations of the world, that we'll probably just always get along. It'll be the new peace. And then earlier this year, that whole concept came to an end when we now see war taking place um, across the ocean there. And obviously there's a lot of fear that it, it'll spread beyond Ukraine to other places and there's talks of maybe China at some point invading Taiwan. There's talks of the Taliban taking advantage of the, the situation. There's, there's talks of social unrest that is brewing in other nations around the world. As we look at the own, our own nation, there's, there's no doubt that we're probably going to enter into uh, more times of social unrest in our own society with inflation rising, uh, uh, an economic collapse on the horizon, that there, there is this feeling among the nation, there's this feeling among the countries of the world that peace is a thing of the past and that there will be no peace. And of course, when you talk about wars or rumors or wars, for us as Christians, that just brings back memories of reading Bible chapters like Matthew 24, that, that will mark the times of the end. That, that will be the nature of the world that you live in. And quite frankly, it's not going to get any better. It will get darker. Men will more and more move away from a love towards one another and a love of God. And it will become a dark and bleak place to be in. Jesus said, when he returns, will he even find faith on the earth? We know that the final days are not the best days of the world. They're the worst 
But that's what makes the return of Christ such a glorious thing. And as we look at the possibility of us living in those days, we always think, well, maybe that's my great, 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 you know, uh, future parents in the, the, like, maybe some other generation in the future will encounter that. Uh, That won't be me, but we don't know, do we? In fact, it seems likely as we read the news every day, as we read the Bible and compare the two together, we're thinking, am I living in those days? And as such, you're tempted, I think a lot of Christians are really tempted right now, to live in fear. What happens if I lose all my money? What happens if we're invaded? What happens if if China attacks Taiwan? Do we respond and does that trigger a domino effect of nations fighting against nations? What happens if the Taliban gain strength again and tax us on our own soil like they did not so long ago? What happens if all of these rumors and these thoughts and these ideas, these fears that are looming on the edge, what happens if, if all of that comes to be? It cripples us. It, it puts us in a stage of fear. And because of that, I wanted us to take a look at John chapter 20 And be reminded of the very first message on the very first Sunday after resurrection. In John 20, in verse number 19, it opens with the words, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week. This is Sunday, and it is a Sunday that happened almost 2,000 years ago. We're just a few years from um, that that 2,000-year marker. This would have been the very first Sunday of the Christian church. This would have been the day of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That morning, um, several women have already encountered the resurrection of Jesus. Peter and John obviously have seen and heard. There are others that on the road to Emmaus, they had encountered the resurrected Jesus. But this is the first time. This is the evening, the conclusion of that day. And this is the first time that Jesus reveals himself to his disciples as a group assembled together. And notice how they're assembled together. Then the same day at evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut. That same Greek word could be translated locked. So they're, they're in a large room behind doors, presumably locked, where the disciples were assembled. And the reason it says is for the fear of the Jews. So they're hiding in the shadows. Three days prior to this, their Messiah, their Lord, their leader was crucified. They watched his body taken off of a cross and put into a new tomb. They have been sitting around wondering what is next. It was the Sanhedrin that condemned their leader to death. It was the Roman soldiers that had executed him on the cross. And it was the temple police that were going around looking for any of his other followers. And here they are, presumably in the upper room, locked away, hiding in the shadows, debating with one another, how do we get out of this situation? They're looking for us. Obviously, they're coming for us next. How do we get back home? How do we get back to Galilee, which is outside of their jurisdiction? The the roads are covered. They're they're everywhere. They're all over the place. We're stuck up here in this this room. They're going to see us. They know who we are now. They're crippled in fear. They are crippled in fear of what the government might do to them. Sounds familiar with a lot of Christians today. As they think about all of the turmoil going on in the world, and they feel like maybe what I should do is separate myself from the world, lock myself away, ostracize myself from the rest of the world because I don't know what the government is going to do to me. They're coming after me. Here they are, not knowing what's next, crippled in fear, and I love the middle of verse number 19. Jesus came and stood in the midst. The same is true today. When you're at the point of your life, when you are burdened more than you can bear with the fears and the uncertainties of this life or the days ahead, just remember Jesus is never that far away. 
And he can always stand in your midst, even if the doors are locked. Even if you haven't invited him in, he can make himself available for all who need him. And I want you to notice the very first message, the very first Easter message. I've been in ministry most of my life. In fact, almost, I feel like the entirety of my life. It hasn't been, but I've been in ministry for a long, long time. And I've preached a lot of Easter sermons over the years. And this is the very first Easter message that was ever preached, and it comes from the lips of Jesus, and it begins with one single word of importance, peace be with you. The very first Easter message that Jesus gave to the church gathered is shalom, be at peace. Don't fear what the government might do to you. Don't fear what lays ahead in the days ahead, which, by the way, they had a lot to fear. It wasn't, it wasn't um, meaningless fears. All, all of these individuals, most of which will be martyred in the days ahead. Some of them will face starvation. Some of them will be on the run, hiding in the catacombs. Some of them will flee to other nations, trying to escape the persecution that follows them. There will certainly be hard days ahead of them. But the message of Christ to this church is, peace be with you. Shalom. Now, that's not the message I would give. I'm I'm glad that I wasn't the resurrected Messiah. I'm glad that I wasn't the guy that walked into that room and had something to say to these guys. Because I know exactly what I would have said to these knuckleheads. I know exactly what would be going on in my mind. I would have walked into that room and said, what the heck, guys? I'm up on the cross, bleeding out. You abandoned me, going off somewhere else, hiding in the shadows, pretending to people like you don't even know me, locking yourself up in rooms. We talked about this so many times. Like, you knew exactly what was going to happen, and I even told you where to meet me after. What are you doing? Have you totally lost your mind? If the gospel message depends on you guys, we're all in trouble. That, that's, that's what I would have said if I were talking to these, these knuckleheads gathered in fear, thinking, you, you know better. But yet, we always have a slow and compassionate and merciful Savior who understands our fears. He understands our weak hearts. And that's why in verse number 20, when he had said this, he showed them his hands in his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And so Jesus said to them again, note that word, again. He said to them again, Peace to you. Now up to this point in this message to them, this first resurrection message, he has only used seven words. And of those seven words, two of them is the word peace. He's telling them again and again, be at peace. It's okay, I'm here, I'm alive. I am God. My throne is in heaven. I rule supreme over all. I am sovereign Lord. You, you feel like the Romans are in control right now. You feel like the government is ruling everything right now. You feel like you need to run from the temple police. But let me remind you, I am in control. Everything's going according to my plans. Everything's right on schedule. And so again, peace to you. And I would suppose for us, regardless of what the days look like ahead of us, there are going to be times that we need to remind ourselves again and again and again, be at peace. Wow, I don't know what this means. Why is this happening? Be at peace. Whoa, did you just hear what happened? Did you read the news? Be at peace. Whoa, did you hear what such and such just said? Be at peace is the message that Jesus had to his believers on Easter Sunday. Be at peace. It wasn't a new message, by the way. He had been telling them this over and over again. If you would, take your Bibles and go back a couple of chapters to John chapter 14. and Look at verse number 27. Jesus is with his disciples. This is before the crucifixion. John 14, verse 27, he says to them, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. 
not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I am going to the Father. My Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe. Unfortunately, they didn't, did they? They doubted, and they didn't believe. I hope that we can learn from those lessons. He's already told us what will happen in the days ahead. He's already given us some insight to the future. And unlike the disciples, I hope that we will be believing every step of the way. He says in the end of verse number 30, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandments, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. Now, Jesus tells them that the ruler of this world is coming. That is the prince of the power of the air. This is a title that is often given to Satan and to his antichrist. There is coming a day when God will remove the restraint that he is putting on Satan from him accomplishing his sinister deeds, and he will allow Satan to resurrect a antichrist, a man who will bring about global dominance and global tyranny over all of the world. And he says that day is coming, and that person is coming. But the message is still the same. Be at peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. It's not an earthly peace. It's not a peace that can come and go because you, you bought something and then it got destroyed or lost or stolen. It's not a peace that's contingent upon you, whether or not you make the right decisions or not. It is a peace that comes from Him. He said, peace I, live with, I leave with you, my peace I give to you. He's in heaven. There is nothing on earth that can rob you of the peace that God Himself gives you from heaven. It is a peace that comes from above. It is a peace, as Paul said, that passes all understanding. It is a peace that is secure. It is a peace that is an anchor to the soul. It is a peace that will get us through even the darkest of times. It is a peace that will give us the strength to endure anything. It is a peace that will lead his church to persevere until he returns. It is a peace that no matter what the hurt your Christ will always be the healer. It is a peace that no man can rob you of. The writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 13, as he brings this book to a conclusion, the benediction reads this way. Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do His will, working in you what is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. That is a wonderful promise that all of us as believers should be clinging on to this morning. So my first message, I really have two messages this morning. My first message is to you believers. And it's the same message that was delivered on the very first Easter morning, and that is be at peace. Regardless of what the days ahead look like, be at peace in Jesus Christ and live in the peace of Jesus Christ. But obviously, as it was in the upper room, it so is the case here as well, there will always be the doubters. There will always be those who are skeptics. And such was the case when Jesus was preaching as well. If you would go back to John chapter 20 and look at verse number 24, John introduces us to one of the disciples named Thomas. He's a doubter, partly because he's never around long enough to hear or see the truth of Jesus. And so it says, now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. There's nothing sadder for a pastor than to know that you came to church, and Jesus met with us, there was a movement of God, and you saw lives changed, and you want to celebrate it with another church member, only to find out they weren't there that Sunday. It's a, it's a really sad situation. You're like, hey, did, you know, that was great last Sunday, wasn't it? And they're like, well, I wasn't there. Oh, you weren't there. Where were you? I was, uh, the, I was, I was, uh, uh, I was uh, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. 
You can take it up between you and Jesus on the day of judgment. I don't need to know about where you were last Sunday. But there's nothing more uh, sad and unfortunate when it comes to a pastor to know that you came to church and it was an amazing meeting of the believers. It was an amazing fellowship. There was a, a communion that took place among the people of God, only to find out that some of those who could have been there and could have experienced that blessing as well were not there. Thomas was not there. So verse 25 says, The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Unfortunately, there's always those who are like, Hey, I'm more than willing to believe. As long as you give me some tangible evidence. As long as I can see it with my eyes and touch it with my hands, as long as there's some scientific evidence that will back it up, I'm more than happy to believe. But until then, I will not believe. I'm I'm a skeptic. One of the biggest problems with doubters in the world is that hearing is never good enough. It has to be preceded with feelings. And and too many people in the world, they want to believe in Jesus, but they're waiting for a feeling. They're waiting for some other evidence other than what the Scriptures itself says. There's a big problem with that, though. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I didn't make that up. That came from Romans 10, 17, a doctrinal book. And Paul said that. That is the, that is the beginning of where your faith starts. Not with seeing, not with feeling. It begins with you hearing God's Word and believing God's Word. This was a big problem for the first church. On the resurrection of Christ, there were those who saw Christ, who heard Christ, and shared that with others, but they didn't believe. In Mark chapter 16, verse number 9, it says, Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. And he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. You see, there's doubters in this room. You've read the same gospel message that I've read. You've heard the same gospel story that I have heard. You know the truth, and yet you still doubt. You still do not believe. Well, Jesus has a message to you this morning. He always has a message to the doubters. If you're there in John 20, look at verse 26. After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, stood in the midst and said, same message eight days later, three times now, again and again and again, Jesus says, peace to you. Now this time, it's not a peace because of the fear of the temple police. It's not a peace that is needed because you're fearing for your physical life. It is a peace that is needed because of Thomas's lack of peace with God. It is an internal peace. It is a a peace of the soul. And Jesus says to Thomas in verse 27, Reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving but believing. That is the message to you this morning. Do not be unbelieving. Don't be like Thomas where you have to touch Jesus in order to believe in Jesus. Let the message of the gospel be sufficient in and of itself. Let the message of the scriptures be enough to be your salvation. Be not unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. My prayer is that every person that came to the cross church today, which was a lot. I I would imagine we've probably had a record-breaking day here at the Cross Church. In all of the 90, nearly 90 years of the Cross Church, this is probably the largest gathering ever here. 
And I pray that every person that came today would have that as their heart's desire, my Lord and my God. Now Jesus said to Thomas in verse 29, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That would be us. I never saw Jesus physically. Never stuck my finger in his, the palms of his hands. I, I never felt the side where they pierced him. I've never been to the throne room of God. I never walked with Jesus through Galilee. I've walked through Galilee. I've never seen Jesus there. I've walked through the streets of Jerusalem, but I didn't see Jesus when I was there. I've never felt or heard him physically. I'm like the rest of you. I read in the Bible that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus came to take the place of all sinners by dying on the cross to pay the penalty for the crimes that you and I committed. And all those who repent of their sins and put their faith in him have everlasting life. I read that in the scriptures and I believed it. And because of that, the blessedness of my heart is greater than that of Thomas's. By the way, that is the whole purpose of John writing this book, if you remember. Look at the last verses there, verse 30. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. Jesus is real. He is alive. He rose from the dead nearly 2,000 years ago. When we sing these songs, we're singing to a real person. When we read these words, we are reading about a living person. And those who put their faith in Him, these words were recorded for us so that we would believe. And that those behind us would believe as well. And if you're in that category of a doubter this morning, all I can say to you is the same thing Jesus said to Thomas. Do not be unbelieving, but be believing. Would you do that right now? Set aside your skepticism. Set aside your doubts. Set aside your fears, come before the Christ who is alive, pray to Him and say, would you save me? I believe in you. And if you've never done that, I'm going to pray, and I'd like for you to pray to that Lord to be your Savior, your God, your King, both now and forevermore.